All right, so uh, I think we're done here. So uh, beam me up. Oh, no, wait, don't beat me, beam me up. I just looked into the science of it. No, don't beam me up. So this is something I've wanted to do for a little over a year. Uh, other things kept getting in the way, but finally we're going to deliver uh, the first episode of uh, my reaction to the classic Star Trek series. And if there's success and interest, I'll keep doing more episodes and maybe go on to some of the uh, later series. There's not a lot that hasn't already been said about Star Trek. You could fill a library like this with books and blog posts and all kinds of things that have been written about this series. And deservedly so. It is iconic and was a trailblazer for science fiction. I can only talk about a little bit about my personal experience with it, which is that I'm 51. So I was too young to see it air originally. And when I was growing up, it was mainly shown as reruns on television. This was before we had the movies and Star Trek The Next Generation, and it became a whole franchise and so forth. So it was this sort of weird show that would show up on Channel 46. And as a kid, this was a show that was different from anything else. It wasn't just that it was science fiction. It was science fiction that was thoughtful and character-based and had interesting ideas, even if it didn't sometimes know what to do with those ideas. And I can only imagine how revolutionary this was in the 1960s when it was shown originally. Now, this is the part where I'm supposed to say that Star Trek inspired me to go into my career in astronomy. But it actually didn't. While I enjoyed the series and while I am an astronomer, it, there was re not really a connection between them. When I went to college, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I went through various phases of, of careers that I was going to take. And eventually I was going to be an engineer and I just sort of happened to end up in astronomy which is odd because people who know me pretty well say they can't imagine me doing anything else other than astronomy. But I do know a lot of people of my generation and older who were inspired to go into science by Star Trek. This was a show that was optimistic about the future, that showed a future that was exciting and bold and wasn't the doom and gloom we were seeing in so many movies and TV shows at the time. And I know when Michelle Nichols passed away last year, there were a lot of people of color and women who talked specifically about how her character inspired them to go into science. And so this did have a huge impact on a lot of careers, just not mine. Now, there's a lot of Star Trek to cover here, so and I'm not going to go through it episode by episode and because I think that's boring, and most of them don't have a lot of scientific concepts that uh, would be worth talking about. I think what I'm going to do is talk about like one concept overall in Star Trek and then go through one episode that I think talks about some interesting things that illuminate some interesting aspects of science. Now, there is nothing more iconic to Star Trek than beaming. The words beam me up in conjure Star Trek more than anything else. But would those kind of instantaneous transporters work? Are they possible? Not really. Not, not at least based on our understanding of physics. The canonical explanation seems to be that they convert mass into energy patterns, beam that across space, and then reassemble it at its destination into matter. Now, the reason this was done in the series was to save money on having to have effects shots of spaceships taking off and landing on planets and so forth. And the visuals for it definitely came from Forbidden Planet, which I previously discussed as a precursor to Star Trek. But there are multiple problems, as I see it, with using this as a method of transporting people across space. First of all is information. If you're going to convert someone into energy and then reassemble that energy into a person, you're going to have to reassemble every little molecule of that person one at a time, right? Well, there are approximately 10 to the 27th molecules in a human body. In each one, you have to have at least seven pieces of information, what molecule it is for one, but also its three-dimensional position and its three-dimensional motion. And the more you break down that body into, say, atoms, the more the information needs go up. If you're breaking it down to atoms, that's another order of magnitude more information you have to convey with this system. If you're breaking it down to the subatomic particles, that's another order of magnitude or maybe two that you're getting in information. I roughly calculated that the amount of storage space you would need to record the position and identity and motions of all the molecules in a human body would be about one ronabyte of information, which is about a 100,000 times as much storage information as the entire human race has right now. And that's just to transport one person. Now, we are seeing huge advances in computing. When I first started in computing, as about 10 years old, 
1982. The disc we had was about yay big and had 10 megabytes of information on it. Somewhere in this house, I have a thumb drive that has 128 gigabytes on it. And I say somewhere in this house because it's so small, I keep losing it. If you see it, let me know. So, and we've seen computing power. There's Moore's Law and stuff like that that shows that the computing power doubles every 18 months. And so, yes, you could get you could get a lot more data storage, a lot more data processing. Quantum computing in particular looks like it's going to be a, no pun intended, quantum leap in our computing power. But even then, you're going to eventually start running into quantum mechanical physical limits and how much data you can store in a certain area. And so this is an enormous amount of information to store. And if you misplace a one or a zero, if your checksum fails, then someone's missing an arm or something like that. So you have to have very reliable and very massively powered computers to do this. There's also the energy consideration that there's a lot of binding energy holding my body together, electromagnetic forces. You're going to have to exert a lot of force to pull that apart. And I roughly calculated you would need about an atomic bomb to do that to, to one person. And that's just if you're breaking th things down at the atomic level. If you're talking about subatomic levels where you're breaking people's bodies down into quarks and leptons and electrons and so forth, you're talking a couple more orders of magnitude energy. You literally need nuclear bombs to break apart atoms. That's how nuclear bombs work. And so the energy needs for that would be gigantic. But also, how do you convert matter into energy? Well, according to relativity, that is possible. E equals mc squared means that energy and mass are interchangeable. And when you have nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, you are literally converting ma mass into energy. But in order to do that to a person on a large scale, you would the only way to do it as far as we know in the laws of physics, would be to combine their body with an equal amount of antimatter. And then to reassemble it, you would have to break that energy down into matter and antimatter, somehow sequester off that antimatter, which for the mass of a person would be enough to blow up a continent and store it somewhere and then just have this matter there. And remember, they don't have machines necessarily at where they're beaming to. They're beaming down onto the surface of planets and things like that. So somehow they're able to, at a distance, make this conversion of energy into mass and do something with the antimatter or bring it back together. There's one other aspect to it. And the reason I said at the beginning, I wouldn't want to be beamed. We don't understand the nature of consciousness. We don't understand why I experience the universe through my body and you experience it through yours. We don't know what makes me, me, what makes you, you. And creating a copy of yourself would be a different person. Just like twins are different people, if they copied your body, that would be a different person. And in fact, in one of the Next Generation episodes, they accidentally create a copy of uh, William Riker, and he is a different person, has different life experiences from their, where their paths diverged. As far as we know, if you converted someone into energy in one end, beamed them to the other, and created them again, you would have that person would die and a new person would spring into existence with the body and memories of that other person. Now, it's the 24th century. Maybe they understand consciousness in a way we don't. Maybe there's a soul chip in the computer that's able to transfer consciousness. Star Trek did dabble with the idea of transferring consciousness between people or from people to objects and things like that. And so it is certainly possible, given what they do in the series, that they've figured this out and, and knowing it. But... If I were faced with the possibility, I'd be a lot like Dr. McCoy. He insisted we go first, sir. Said something about first seeing how it scrambled our molecules. The amount of effort that would have to go into transporting just one human being seems just so enormous. Why don't you just build a spaceship? Just build a spaceship. That seems like a lot easier. Now, there were budget reasons they didn't do that. But if you ask me whether I would pursue transporting someone via this energizer process or building a spaceship, build a spaceship. Now, the episode we're going to talk about today is not one of anyone's favorite episodes, but I think it deals with some cool stuff, which is uh, the middle of season one episode, the Galileo 7. In this episode, a shuttlecraft, they found shuttlecraft eventually in the series, a shuttlecraft is dispatched into a quasar, we'll get to that in a moment, to do some scientific investigation. It crashes on a planet, it's severely damaged, the Enterprise has a deadline to meet where they have to go to another planet, so they have limited time to look. And Spock has to have basically his first command trying to get people off this planet, especially when there's hostile natives around, and be able to get into space in time for the Enterprise to rescue them. Not a great episode, somewhere in the middle of the rankings. I think that's relatively fair. 
but uh, we'll talk about it as we go on. Our course leads us past Murasaki 312, a quasar-like formation, vague, undefined, priceless opportunity for scientific investigation. So right off the bat, quasar-like object. Quasars, this is actually Star Trek being kind of uh, very up-to-date. This episode was uh, written and shot in 1966, aired in early 1967. Quasars were a relatively new discovery. I've discussed them in my video on fast radio bursts about the mystery of quasars and how that was figured out. Uh, by 1966, we had actually figured out what they were, but it was still being debated and it was relatively new science. What quasars actually are, are the cores of distant galaxies, where you have these giant black holes that weigh millions or billions of times as much as the sun, and material is spiraling into it, and as it spirals in, it is heated up, and that gets so hot and so bright, it can outshine the entire galaxy. The reason they're called quasars is because they are quasi-stellar objects. They look like stars on a on a photographic plate, but they didn't behave like stars. They were moving very fast away because of the expansion in the universe. Their light was varying dramatically. They had enormous amounts of X-ray and radio emission, which stars do not have. And so uh, this is inaccurate that you would have a quasar in our galaxy. Now he does say quasar-like. So maybe if you found a black hole that had an accretion disk around it, Remastered Edition has a new special effect which looks a little bit more like an accreting black hole. Points for going with something that was very new and contemporaneous in science when this movie was made, but by this point we had a pretty good explanation for what these were, and so uh, minus points for getting it wrong. Dr. McCoy, reading on the atmosphere, please. Partial pressure of oxygen, 70 millimeters of mercury, nitrogen 140. Reasonable if you're not running in competition. 70, 140, that would be atmospheric pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. So this kind of atmospheric pressure is the kind of thing you'd have maybe near the top of Mount Everest. So breathable, yes, but unless you were very physically fit, you'd probably pass out trying to breathe that. We have no chance at all to reach escape velocity. And if we ever hope to make orbit, we'll have to lighten our load by at least 500 pounds. Kilos. Free grown men. Uh, you could put it that way. So this is sort of the heart of the second half of the episode, that they only have so much fuel, and that's not enough to attain escape velocity. If I take this ball and throw it gently, it goes up a little bit and then returns to my hand. If I throw it a little bit harder, it goes up a little higher, but eventually returns to, a, to my hand. Escape velocity is how hard I would have to throw this ball for it to go up, and go up and keep going up and for gravity never to slow it down enough for it to return. It escapes out into infinity. It is very difficult to attain escape velocity from a planet or planetoid like this. Uh, you need an enormous amount of energy. So what you would only be able to do is to obtain orbit, that is go into orbit around the planet or into a suborbital where you go up and then come back down. But what he's saying here is uh, about the weight. So you have a certain amount of fuel, certain amount of thrust, the more weight you have, the slower you're going to go, the less weight you have, the faster you're going to go. If you're not going fast enough, you will not achieve that velocity necessary to obtain orbit. In uh, my 2001 video, I talked about how orbits work, that you're basically going to the side so fast that by the time you fall, gravity pulls you down. You've gone around the curve of the planet. And so an orbit is a perpetual fall, which means you have to be moving very fast sideways in order to have that orbit. So you need enormous amounts of velocity to get into orbit. Now, a suborbital is where you go up just a little bit and then come back down. You don't actually have enough velocity to go around the planet. It's like if I took this ball and threw it really hard and it went up and up and then came back down to Earth, but not throwing it hard enough to go around the Earth and into orbit. Suborbitals are what Alan Shepard did on his first flight. They're what uh, Blue Origin has been doing with things like William Shatner uh, from this, with uh, not going to orbit, but at least getting out into space and so forth. It's a relationship between thrust and weight, how far you're going to get. And what he's saying is they need to get rid of some weight. And people are heavy, and so you sometimes have to leave those behind. There's a great short story that was actually made into a sci-fi movie, I think, a few years ago, uh, called The Cold Equations, about a girl who stows away aboard a uh, ship, spaceship going to Mars, I think. And when they find her, they realize that they've got too much weight. They're not gonna be able to land on the planet. And the only way that they're gonna be able to land safely is to throw her out of an airlock. This is a very real concept that happens no matter what technology you have. The laws of physics don't change just because you have Star Trek technology. There's still the laws of physics. 
I'd be trying to get the weight down as much as possible. I'd be ripping out the carpeting. They have these chairs on there, which are kind of useless. They don't have seatbelts or anything. And in fact, the yeoman leaps out of hers when they take off. Why don't you dump those chairs? That seems it would seem a lot of weight. Every ounce of weight you get rid of is either a better ability to get into orbit or a longer suborbital, so more time in flight for the Enterprise to see you. In less than 24 hours, the Enterprise will be forced to abandon its search in order to make a rendezvous. If we can't maintain orbit after that time, it won't make any difference. Star Trek at its best is about choices and the kind of, these kind of dilemmas. And I really like the way they frame this, that they have a limited time, they have to get up into orbit. It doesn't matter what happens after that. Either they get rescued by the Enterprise or they die. And so everything becomes focused on that. Jettison the fuel and ignited it. We need that fuel to maintain orbit. Are you out of your mind? Perhaps, Mr. Bowman. Spock is sort of rid at the, at the end of the episode about how he made an emotional decision here or how he made a good gamble. This is actually the quite logical choice. Again, as they said earlier, the only way they survive is if the Enterprise rescues them. If the Enterprise is gone, if it if she goes to the planet and comes back, it doesn't matter. They'll be dead by then, either from crashing onto the planet or burning up in the atmosphere or killed by the creatures. But I do like, again, again this idea of, of making a choice, of gambling everything on the one chance you have and knowing that you have a limited resource fuel, unlimited resource energy of your orbit, and expending both at the same time to maximize your chance of being rescued is the logical and correct choice. Uh, the only other thing to talk about with this episode is the aliens um, that are on this planet. This planet is inside a quasar, which is not going to work. We'll pretend that it's just a black hole and so forth. I don't know that you would have enough climactic stability to evolve creatures like that, especially such big ones. Biospheres are built from the oceans up. All life on Earth started very primitive in primordial seas and has built up to this level. If the oceans died, we would die. So if you have this arid, low oxygen planet, I don't see that you could have the resources to evolve like the life like this. Uh, maybe they're an alien race that themselves crash landed on there and have been stranded for thousands of years and so forth. Whatever. As I said at the beginning, Galileo 7 is not going to be on anyone's list of favorite episodes ever. And I think I agree. It's it's has some good parts, which is Spock's first command and the conflict between him and the crew over his logical reasoning versus the emotional reasoning of the creatures he's dealing with and the emotional reasoning of the crew he's dealing with. But it also has some weaknesses, particularly the commissioner who wants to who is constantly harassing Kirk about how they need to get to this planet for no reason other than to harass him and create some unnecessary tension in the plot. Even mediocre Star Trek is still pretty good. And I like this one because of the way it deals with that dilemma, which we may have to face in space travel in the future, that conflict between thrust and weight and how much weight you can carry and how much thrust you're going to get out of it, how much energy you have both in fuel and in orbit. These are trade-offs that rocket scientists and NASA officials consider all the time when we're talking about launching things to Mars or launching things into orbit or launching things into suborbits. There are always trade-offs that uh, have to be made. It's just dictated to you by the laws of physics. And so seeing Star Trek have a episode that kind of revolves around those dilemmas and has to approach them in a logical, consistent way is quite nice. And I think is one of the redeeming qualities of this episode and indeed one of the redeeming qualities of the series and then it often deals with these kind of trade-offs and dilemmas. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Please subscribe and like and recommend to all your friends uh, so we can grow the channel. We just passed 10,000 subscribers thanks to my Oppenheimer video and I am incredibly... Uh, flattered and humbled uh, at the attention that you guys have given this channel. I hope I can produce content that's worthy of your subscriptions. So uh, let me know what you'd like to see for Star Trek in the future. Let me know if this format works for you of talking about a general concept and then going through a specific episode. Uh, we'll have something a little different next time. I've already got it planned out and it's going to be a little bit crazy. So hopefully uh, that will come up soon. Until then, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.